Welcome to Art Power Hong Kong. I'm Rosanna Harris, head of Sinclair Arts and a member of the Art Power Hong Kong Working Group. Thank you for joining us for the first of our series of talks. Before we start, allow me to give you a brief introduction to Art Power Hong Kong and our purpose. Art Power Hong Kong is a non-commercial and globally accessible online platform that highlights the vibrancy and diversity of the arts in Hong Kong. This collaborative campaign has grown organically from a community-wide desire to maintain momentum for the arts in Hong Kong in 2020. Uniting partners from across the arts ecosystem, Art Power Hong Kong showcases that the arts in Hong Kong are open, active, and resilient. The platform will be powered by strong content provided by partners, which include galleries, museums, auction houses, not-for-profit organizations, educational institutions, corporate sponsors of the arts, cultural media outlets, and the stakeholders who support our arts community. The campaign congregates and amplifies the many arts initiatives taking place across the city. Supporting both art, of art activations that are going ahead and utilizing tech innovations to allow all partners to take their initiatives to a wide online community. Art Power Hong Kong will showcase how conversations that engage and excite can happen online and offline. Art Power Hong Kong also acts as the catalyst and anchor for a new moment for the arts in Hong Kong in 2020. Launching today, the Art Power Hong Kong Talks program focuses on the arts community in Hong Kong and will feature spokespeople from partner organizations and the stakeholders that support them. From next week, the talks will take place weekly on Thursdays and be live streamed from the Art Power Hong Kong platform. You can also join the conversation on Instagram, Facebook and LinkedIn or sign up to updates from the platform. Thank you for supporting Art Power Hong Kong and the arts community in Hong Kong. I'm now delighted to introduce you to fellow, fellow working group member Elaine Kwok of Christie's, who will be moderating today's talk on the power of art. Elaine. Great, thank you, Rosanna. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the power of art. Six weeks ago, when a group of us gathered following the announcement of Art Basel's cancellation, Art Basel Hong Kong's cancellation, we spent a fair bit of time trying to come up with a name for our group. We wanted something that conveys the strength, the confidence, and the vitality of the arts in Hong Kong. We want to present to everyone Hong Kong's position as one of the most important, the most exciting art capitals of the world. Art power encapsulates our intentions perfectly. Art has the power to stimulate, galvanize, unite, and create positive change during these challenging times. So for our online talks program, we thought what better way to kick off than with a discussion on the power of art. So I'm very pleased today to be sharing the stage with three members of the Art Power Working Group. First to my right is Katie Dettelli. She is one of the early contemporary gallerists in Hong Kong, founding 10 Chancery Lane Gallery in 2001. The gallery has since been developing the art scene in Asia Pacific and is a key driving force in contemporary arts culture in Hong Kong and Asia. She is also a founder of the Hong Kong Art Gallery Association and was president from 2015 to 2018. Next to Katie, we have Lavina Lee Cadman. She is a co-founder of Art Partners, an independent art consultancy to conceptualize, develop, and realize art projects across Asia. Important projects include launching retail, entertainment, and art property development at H. Queens, and managing large-scale public art events such as Event Horizon and Harbor Art Sculpture Park in Hong Kong. Next to Lavina, we have Alice Mung, who is Executive Director of Asia Society Hong Kong Center, a position she has held since 2012. Prior to Asia Society, Alice has worked in New York as a director of the Museum of Chinese in America from 2009 to 2011. And she's also served as the executive director for the Committee of 100 in the United States, a Chinese American nonprofit membership organization founded by the architect Ayan Pei and by the cellist Yo Yo Ma. 
So, to kick off our discussion, I would like to ask, we often speak about the arts as being a source of soft power. How does a thriving art scene position Hong Kong in the coming decade? Who would like to start? Maybe Alice? Thank you. Thank you, Ling. Um, how does a thriving art scene position Hong Kong in the coming decades? Well, I would say um, soft power um, is more important than ever. Um, and I think um, just our, by location of Hong Kong, we're in the heart of um, greater China and Asia. And um, I think if you look at institutions, uh, cities like New York and London, um, you know, the, the, the art sector is, has been around for, um, you know, for a long time, for over 100 years, I mean, you know, from industrial revolutions onward. And when you talk about these cities, art, you just, it's part of those cities' DNA. And unfortunately, it, for whatever reason, it hasn't been for Hong Kong or Asia, uh, if you, let's think about it. Um, I believe it was around 2000 was the first time uh, when I was living in Hong Kong the first time that I saw the exhibition Inside Out. And that was really a wonderful show. First time I saw the work of Xi Bing, uh, Tai Guo Chang, and, and Zhang Huan, some, and some of the wonderful um, artists from uh, Greater China, from Taiwan, as well as Hong Kong and Macau. I had never seen it before. This was 2000. And I remember it took place at the Museum of Art here in Hong Kong, in Asia Society, even though at that time we did not have a, a space uh, like we have today, um, we collaborated with Museum of Art to bring that show. Um, uh, and that was the first time, I believe, um, and I think Katie can maybe, uh, some of the artists that you've worked with have been in that show. I think the first time many of us have seen um, these artists um, uh, in, in Hong Kong and Asia, and then they've gone on to this every one of them, uh, wonderful career. So I think the soft power aspect of it is really important right now. We talk about the rise of Asia, um, and we talked about rise of China, and, and I think sometimes people are really afraid of these rise of Asia or, or but I think when it comes to the, the art scene, with the arts you understand um, more about the society, the city, and the people. Um, it's, it, it doesn't require language. Right? It required just visually and sitting and standing in front of a piece, art piece, or seeing a performance art. So I think the soft power side of the rise of, of Asia and, and China or greater China is really very important because I find that there's a lot of misunderstanding, um, you know, just from um, just, you know, just, yeah, uh, misunderstanding uh, or, or not understanding Asia. And if you look at the, the founding of Asia Society uh, in 1956 by John D. Rockefeller III, he created Asia Society and Asia Society Museum. Uh, and his intentions was using the wonderful art that he collected uh, from Asia um, to tell, to educate uh, Americans about Asia. So that role of education um, is really, really important. And I don't see, uh, you know, I think everybody now is, is jumping on it. So I think the thriving um, art scene in Hong Kong, and the, you know, your organization have been involved with uh, Hong Kong for 40, 50 years now in terms of uh, the auction. So I think right now what's really exciting is um, the, the, the entire ecosystem will help showcase um, uh, Hong Kong, China, Asia in a, in a balanced sort of way. Great, thank you, Alice. Lavina? Um, I think that the thriving art scene and also the thriving art business in Hong Kong has given Hong Kong a really unique positioning in Asia Pacific. I think that there's, you know, Hong Kong, if I'm not incorrect, is the number three art most traded cities in the, in the world after um, New York and London, right? So it puts us in a position of power in terms of the art business, which also then brings an inflow of fantastic um, international galleries as well as nurturing fantastic local galleries. And then that whole ecosystem then supports the local artists to develop a better career. And um, and then in turn, you know, the last year we've seen openings of major art institutions, you know, like um, 
Daikun, like Museum of Art. Of course, we have Asia Society, all the university museums, and you know, um, and and I think that the art institution also is able to um, bring prominence to the local artists working today and properly exhibit them for the international visitors and the global world to discover them. Just like London has a Tate Museum, and you can go into the Tate and see the best of the best. I think that once M Plus um, the pavilions open, but once West Kowloon opens, that also also will bring prominence towards um, art and culture in a, in a major way because it's a huge development and it links us to the Greater Bay Area through the fast rail. So it opens an audience of over 60 million within this region to that art and culture space. So I think within the next decade, I think that I see positive, you know, um, um, art power or soft power in Hong Kong. Um, and I think that, in summary, it, it is based upon institutional support as well as um, international art business support that brings also media support. And I think that rounds it up by um, having a great system to promote our local artists into the international arena as well. Great. Katie? So the Hong Kong... Um really art scene is really young. It's uh, in the 1970s, the Hong Kong Museum of Art opened in City Hall with just some um, kind of school style panels where they just hung some things on top. And um, the development it, it started to happen when I arrived in Hong Kong in the 90s when um, a few galleries started to pop up and, um, and artists started to come out and actually the place where you could see art happening was uh, at the auction houses. That was a, a place where we had a wider view of contemporary art from Asia. And then working, starting to work with these artists um, from China, from Southeast Asia, um, and uh, the Asia Pacific, there was, it was an, just something beginning, an explosion, and how fast it's come. We opened our gallery in 2001, and to see how fast all of that has progressed, and how we've, um, we've gone from just that, you know, real small town kind of art uh, blossoming to really an explosion and being what uh, Lavina said, the third the third um, market in the world where art is traded. Um, but at, at the end of the day, it's really these artists from this region that are in this wonderful moment of development and Hong Kong being a global city that can offer international artists to have access to the greater Asia region. So. Thank you, Katie. It's been very heartening for me because I grew up in Hong Kong in the 80s and the 90s where, rightly or wrongly, the city was known as a cultural desert. I moved back in 2008, and when I was looking for a job in the arts and cultural sector, auction was the obvious place to go. That's why I ended up at Christie's. Um, back then, there were no international galleries. Um, the gallery scene here is thriving, but it was very small. Asia Society was not here yet. Um, even the institutions were much fewer and farther in between now. And I feel that with this, I, I feel very, very lucky in this past 12 years now that I've been back at Hong Kong to be witnessing this transformation of the art scene here to see how not only the commercial side, the art business side, but also the institution side, it's all changing. Um, I also feel that with this, um, we've attracted great international talent. I found it very interesting that working on Art Power, the people that I've been having conversations with, there are many that are from Hong Kong, but many also from other places who have found this a place to build their art careers. I think it also draws people to want to study here. A lot of people would want to study in Hong Kong because of the internship opportunities from living here, um, and also the mentorship opportunities and participating in the art world. And also, it, it, it has the power to drive tourism. People People then now want to come to experience the art scene in Hong Kong. Now, given the urgency of the coronavirus situation, um, how is art still relevant and how can it drive positive change? I'd love to hear you ladies speak about that. Should I start? Well, anyways, first of all, life goes on. And um, art is a, is a wonderful um, thing to to experience during uh, these difficult times. Um, I would say that, um, in fact, galleries are very safe places to go. They're not very crowded. <laughs> so welcome. <laughs> 
and um, this, uh, this, this situation is part of life, and it's, it's unprecedented, but as I said, you know, we keep doing what we do, and we, we hope to engage, whether through means of a digital platform, uh, more so at the moment, um, and we hope to really collaborate with them um, in innovative ways to be able to educate people in art and, and try to get as many people and maybe even more people involved with what's happening I I culturally in Hong Kong. Um, so how is art still relevant? So I was doing a little bit of research this morning, and according to some studies in America, um, looking at art actually de-stresses you. And if you look at a piece of art that you like, that you strongly identify with, um, blood rushes to the part of the brain that gives you pleasure. So, so it has some de-stressing you know, kind of um, uh, opportunities for you to look at art. And what is, uh, how can we drive positive change? Well, I think the Hong Kong Art Power Campaign is a way we've been trying to drive positive change in the in the art community here, you know, so, so yes, we are promoting people to go into small groups to see museum shows and exhibitions and institutional exhibitions, but if you don't feel comfortable, we're driving you online now to see it virtually and to have virtual content. And for the artists that can't come to Hong Kong, we're driving you towards podcasts and Zoom calls of artists to see their insight. So I think the positive change here is that we're looking at different ways to look at art using a different technology platform to give people opportunities to see it in a different way and um, for people to interact with art um, even if you're not comfortable going out to a gallery. But, you know, um, so there are different ways that we're driving positive change here. Thanks. Um, um, I have a, a more personal story um, in that art, I think, um, is, um, I think when we were kids, we were all artists, but somewhere along the way, we, we stopped drawing. Um, we had a wonderful uh, story of a, a gentleman, Mr. Wong. Um, during our last exhibition, um, Irene Zhou, and the Irene Zhou show was about um, art as a uh, 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 art and mental health, thanks to the support from the Jockey Club, we really looked at the, uh, you know, how art can help, like, like Lavina said, in terms of the positive um, changes in psyches. And, uh, and Irene Jo herself, uh, you know, really use art she to express her, her, her feelings and her frustrations and so on and so forth. So we had a gentleman that came in, um, literally, and because of what happened last year with the protests, um, Mr. Wong um, came and drew our trees. He drew some beautiful banyan trees, and we thought he was a professional artist. Um, no, he he was a retired janitor, and he found the power of art, the drawing, the participation, um, uh, very therapeutic. And so our colleagues saw him draw, drawing our banyan trees and asked him to take part in the uh, Irene Joe response show, and he did. And he won second prize. And he was so happy um, at the age of 83, uh, we discovered a new artist. And it turned out uh, when he was young, uh, Mr. Wong studied um, design, um, uh, in, in, but couldn't get a career back then, design, and, and could have only done uh, maybe um, uh, manga, um, uh, the, the yeah. Japanese manga, or, or a Chinese version of it. And back then, he's 83, there was no career for somebody like Mr. Wong, so he ended up being a janitor. And, but his love of art, um, he had a stroke, and his wife encouraged him to, to uh, go back to, to uh, drawing. And if you see his work, I mean, I mean, I feel like we discover an artist uh, in Mr. Wong, and he was so excited when he came in and participated in the, uh, the, the exhibition opening for the response show. And for me, that's a power of art, and that's a power of the positive power of art. Um, so not everyone is going to be the Picassos and 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 then go. But in his case, um, it was just it, it was so inspiring to see. So I think that's how 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 it is still relevant. Um, I think all of us um, uh, have potential either appreciate or participate. I, for me, is going to to see exhibitions, going to galleries, going to museum. Um, it is very much, um, like you said, it's a very 
relaxing. Um, I miss it now that this last couple of months we have not had it, uh, but doesn't mean you can't get online. I've been watching a lot of uh, art documentaries and, and uh, uh, stories about artists. So I think that is really the enduring, uh, enduring power of it. Thank you very much for sharing that. And I want to share a story. Um, during World War II, during the Blitz in England, uh, the National Gallery had to move their paintings away in storage so that it would be safe from the, from the Blitz um, in order to take for all the treasures. But what they soon realized was the, uh, the British, they really missed looking at the paintings. They really wished, missed looking at the art. And so what the National Gallery did during the war was they would um, display one painting at a time, just one. Uh, so that just in case the National Gallery gets bombed, all the other treasures would be, would, would be kept. So they would rotate and show different pieces. And I want to share that story because that just goes to show, even in face of war, how important art is for humanity. Nowadays, we have sort of a, a different kind of war. You know, it's the enemy is a virus, um, and it's the 21st century. Um, it's a different kind of war. We can't have big groups looking at a single painting, but what we have are digital tools for people to engage online, and that's very much what Art Power is about. Now, I want to speak a little bit more about your individual institutions. Um, Alice, the Asia Society is known as a leading platform <clears throat> for art knowledge exchange in many fields, including business, foreign policy, and education. So how does arts and culture fit into this conversation? Um, it fits very well into the conversation in that I think um, um, if you look at a hu human being, we have a right side and left side of the brain. And uh, you know, it's not just about uh, making money and going to work. We also have, um, it, you know, uh, going to the movies, going to theater, I mean, the appreciation of the arts. So for me, as an organization, um, Asia Society is that way. We have a right side and a left side. And when you said 2008, we were not here. Asia Society was here. In fact, uh, in 1990 was when Asia Society Hong Kong came into being here in Hong Kong. But on the arts and culture side, we did not really go into arts and culture full scale until we opened this site in 2012. And that now uh, about 70% of our programs are in the arts and cultural space. And, and before, when our programming was mostly in business and policy, it was very much uh, business people, our luncheon programs. But now, having this arts and cultural space, we have a gallery and we have programs, uh, we now can draw, um, uh, we have family membership, individual membership. So right now our, our audience is more diverse. And so this is a beauty of, of um, you know, having this um, arts and culture as part of this institution that also has the business, uh, business policy and education. So it fits really dovetail, I think, again, um, very nicely to what Asia Society's mission is. It's about bridging, and arts and culture is a wonderful way to uh, bridge understanding of each other. So the power of art in terms of cross-cultural communication. Correct. Great. Um, Lavina, could you tell us more about public art projects? Um, what exactly are they? Why should we do them, and what's their impact? Um, so I think what, what we're seeing in Hong Kong is that um, we would love to do more projects just in the open. So we're trying to get people to just encounter art in their daily life without even having to walk in a gallery or a museum or you know an exhibition space. So the way we do it is we put art in very public places. So one of the projects that we worked on um, two years ago was the Harbor Arts Sculpture Park. So where we had uh, 22 sculptures across Tamar Park, uh, in front of the Academy of Performing Arts, in front of Hong Kong Art Center, and, um, and in front of City Hall. And so people were just going around their daily lives and suddenly they encountered these fantastic sculptures. And so we had 949,000 people that came through the Sculpture Park, it's free to the public. So it's about um, a million, 949,000. Yeah, 949,000 wow. within the yeah, two month period. And and it was great because the way we see it is a museum without walls, you know, and it makes people closer to their uh, civic spaces. It makes uh, the art makes this humanizes the, the different public areas for us. And it was a great opportunity to also do a bit of um, 
educational outreach. So we worked with Hong Kong Art Center and we created a um, teaching program within all of the um, primary tertiary university schools within the Hong Kong Education Bureau. And it was about how to appreciate um, art and, um, and learn about public art. And then we took, uh, we had 96 free tours that you can sign up for every weekend um, to come see the the, um, the sculpture park led by um, a curator. And it was great as well, even if you don't know anything about the art, we had an app that you can download for free. And there was uh, it was in Cantonese, uh, Mandarin and English. So all you have to do is point at the sculpture and press the button and then the app will tell you about the artwork. Um, or you can just enjoy it um, yourself. So I think, what, and also when we do these projects, I think um, what we're trying to get behind it is also to grow um, the knowledge of the local artists. So we had 25% of the artists was from Hong Kong, supported by the, uh, uh, the Art Development Council, and the rest were international artists. So there was uh, also an artist exchange. And uh, one of the great stories that came out of it was that one of the Hong Kong artists has never done large scale sculptures and his, um, his studio doesn't allow it. So he created a gigantic tent in new territories outside his studio to create this large sculpture. And although the sculpture was disintegrating throughout the the, the sculpture part. It was part of the learning experience. And then he was able to talk to some other international artists like Anthony Gormley, Michael Craig Martin that did large scale sculptures. And, and there was a dialogue about how he can maybe learn from them to do it better. So I think within the public art, what's important is that people feel don't feel intimidated. They don't have to go to an art fair or a gallery or a museum. They can just walk by their daily life to a park and, and be able to see art in a very natural environment. So I think that's why it's, it's great for us to do more public art um, so more people can encounter art and be more comfortable with it and grow an interest, I guess, in art in that, in that way. Um, and I think that the... Impact was great because we saw all walks of life in the park every day and um, people did ask us if we were going to do another installment of this and we hope to be able to do it very soon. <laughs> Sounds incredibly powerful and impactful. Um, Katie, could you speak a little bit about the power of an art dealer? Um, what's your power in shaping an artist's career and in shaping taste? Um, well, okay, so a gallery is really the first place where an artist shows. So, I mean, outside of uh, the school environment. Um, so the gallery is really giving an artist a, their first opportunity to um, show their work, fund their work, promote their work, and, um, and really kind of follow their careers, allowing them to have the, the dreams and the, and the space to experiment, um, and also to of course, support the artist's career. Um, uh, galleries are very passionate people who have a very close relationship with artists. So, um, you know, it, that's actually the best part of it, <laughs> to really follow through long-term um, relationships with these artists and, and how their careers develop. Um, you know, now uh, the, the, when the YBAs, the, the young British artists were, were first showing, they were not part of the establishment and, and now they are, right? So um, that's, that's kind of the, how the galleries um, uh, are the first step in an artist's career. Um, how do we develop taste? I, I would say that, um, of course, each gallery does have a certain passion or feeling for art, but um, it's how it, it relates in the context of the wider picture. Um, art is a mirror of our society. It's, it's showing our collective consciousness. And so it's like a mirror and um, what we are all feeling, sort of the artists are bringing it out. Um, it's a, this is a very important time for artists across the board as well. And, and what's gonna come out from, from this, this current situation is going to be very interesting for the future. Um, uh, developing taste, I think we're in a post-taste world as well. <laughs> I mean, you have artists, um, you know, um, uh, you know, really touching on all aspects of our society, and some sometimes it's not very pretty. Um, so, what what does that mean by taste? But I think that art has a very important role to play on um, on who we are as a as a as a humanity and um, what is happening. And they have that ability to 
show us that, and um, sometimes not in an easy way. Um, and so, you know, the galleries are there to support that path and to kind of see those those things happening and be able to offer it to the wider public. And then what happens next and how they work in the context of art history is to be seen. Some have critiqued the art world as being elitist. It's great for all of us to sit here in the Asia Society and speak about the power of art. Um, but what can we say more about the impact on the rest of the community? And by community, I don't mean the community of business people around Central at Admiralty. I'm speaking more about kind of more grassroots in Hong Kong. On that community level, what is the impact of the arts? Well, I think the impact of the arts um, is is uh, quite profound. And, and, and going back to my story about Mr. Wong, but all of us, um, you know, we right now uh, being having this facility, um, it's not just about the art fair and our exhibition. One of the things that I think we do really well, and I'm really excited um, that we're always exploring, is really workshops for the community. And, and of course, the kids love it. Um, I just wish uh, in this time uh, that we could do more workshops. Not possible, but we can still do workshop online, um, and keep the kids not only entertained, but learning about art. Um, so the art is, I mean, I, I often, I think some of you heard the story of how I um, was introduced to the world of art when I was a kid in Taiwan. Uh, for me, it was the Palace Museum. Not the fact of going inside it, but being able to play around the Palace Museum um, demystify art for me. I mean, to me, it's, it's, a, it's, a play, it's a place where my family took me on weekends, my parents, and so my love of art really started when I was five or six, being able to, to be in that, you know, and this is Taiwan in, in you know, Back then, the 60s was not, uh, there was no other art scene. Uh, and so, so this, the idea of museum, public institutions, um, uh, is really important. Um, that's why I'm a strong proponent uh, of, of public institutions. Um, and that's why it's so great to see now with all the museum closing, uh, closing their door, they're still making it available, accessible to the public through technology. And so for me, here at Asia Society, is making our our artwork, uh, our exhibitions, our workshop accessible to the community. And what I love when we do it, especially on Sundays, um, when parents or grandparents bring their kids or grandkids and they participate with them together. That is so powerful. And, and I love watching the kids running around the site because they're not afraid of it. Somewhere along the way, um, you know, we, we make art capital A and, and, you know, uh, and especially here in Hong Kong, I think maybe because we didn't grow up, kind of like you said, when you were growing up here in, um, or in earlier, they, Hong Kong didn't have the kind of art scene that maybe I had in, in, in Taiwan. And later on, when I went to the States, I just love museums because I will never collect. I work for nonprofit. Um, but I, that's one reason I love when I was here in Hong Kong in the 90s. Um, to be able to go to um, the the you know the previews, to see some of the art in person and touching them so in some cases, and that demystification of art is really important for an institution, for all of us, not just public institution. But um, you know you don't want to be terrified of going into a gallery and people giving you dirty looks, right? You you want to go in and enjoy and 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 also draw. You know, I love the art jams. Uh, I was just at um, an institution this weekend, and to see the art jamming, I think that is really important for us to remember as a community that art is for everyone, and it's not just for collectors and not just for those who can afford to buy, but go in and just wander around. So that most of the exhibition since we've been around, we've done 24 shows, 90% of our show has been free, thanks to General City of, of, of ADC, Jockey Club, our, our patrons, Robert Ho Foundations, and all that. So I think that's really important for us to keep in mind um, the power of art is that it has to be accessible. I love you sharing that story. My children love coming to the Asia Society. and. They're very comfortable here. They run around, sometimes a little too comfortable. I have to watch them and not let them touch the art. And I'm so glad that in Hong Kong, again, that my children are growing up in a completely different art environment from myself. Um, so the power of art on the community. 
who would like to take it next? I'm quite lucky because a, a, a lot of the projects, what I do involves bringing art to the community, whether we're setting up a public art installation in a shopping mall, so you can just walk past, be shopping, going to the supermarket, and then you can encounter some great public art. So I think it is important to bring art to the community, and it's great that we have facilities like Asia Society, the sculpture park on the rooftop that's coming, it's gonna be great. You know, I think that, I think that more and more, once you bring the art out to the public, um, then I think it demystifies it, and I think the more we can put it everywhere, <laughs> I mean, that'd be great if we have more space in all of our buildings, our lobbies of buildings, hotels. So I think I think that's a good way to to make it art for all. Um, I think that art is um, is misunderstood to be elitist. Um, it is accessible to to everyone. Nobody's uh, choosing who can come and see it. But it's more of an educational um, uh, situation where people th are afraid to go inside. They don't know that they can go inside. So we had done a project in the wet market where we showed art videos from some of the world's famous um, uh, video artists, and we put them in like uh, um, in, in the butcher shop, chopping the meat, and we had these interjections. And it was really interesting to see the just the local community interacting with these these artists, and how you know. And I think that is a goal. That's a continued goal. Um, Art is, is bringing together the intellect with the soul. It's the fabric of the soul and bringing that forth to the wider community. So, you know, we feel art, right? We feel music, we feel opera, we feel dance, we feel a painting. And um, it it's, it's, should not be thought of as elitist. And these kind of campaigns are, are really the goal to make it more accessible and more inviting to the general public. That's great. Thank you very much, Katie. We have about 20 minutes left, and I just want to open to the floor for questions. Rosanna, can people submit questions online? They could go through Facebook, apparently. Are there any questions from the audience or online? I have more questions. Ah, is that a question? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an auctioneer as well. You know, that's everyone's biggest fear when you're just <laughs> playing with your hair and being, <laughs> yeah, people thinking it's a, it's a, it, it's a bit. Anyhow, okay, if, if no questions for now, I can go back to my, um, my list. Um, the recent outbreak of the virus has pushed people to embrace digital tools and other emerging technologies in a way of promoting artists and engaging with uh, audiences. Uh, do you think this will be the beginning of a new landscape of the art world and the day of these large-scale art gatherings so focused on travel, um, so unsustainable, will be a thing of the past? Um, I don't think so because, in fact, I think people will still want to see. And I think it's up to some of these, these um, uh, fairs or these events to make it uh, continually accessible, whether it's online, um, not just doing that art week, right? So, so I think it's... Um, you can't replace life experiences. Um, and But right now, one of the things um, is also demographics. I mean, young people are gonna consume art differently. So how do you now do an, an art fair, art event, art exhibitions that is able to um, you know, um, attract the different demographics, three or four generations of, of people? That is an interesting challenge. So technology, I think, has a role to play, but I don't think it'll it'll replace it at all. In fact, um, I find myself because this last two months we were so deprived. I I walked by um, the Museum of Art this weekend and I was just was celebrating. But they're because of the um, uh, COVID nineteen. They're they're giving tickets. They, they reopened last week, so they're timing the time tickets, which I think is a great idea because um, uh, you know when you see blockbusters, the time. Uh, tickets, is, it works. So if you don't want uh, uh, a lot of people in a museum um, during this time, I think the time ticket system works really well. Unfortunately, I was there in the afternoon, so the tickets were probably given out. So I can't wait to go back to see the new Museum of Art, which I have not had a chance to see. I heard there's a great Turner show, a lot of local artists. Uh, so I think because of this made me appreciate live art 
exhibitions and live performances. And this, this month, no art uh, festival. Uh, and I was so envious of my sister who posted online. She was at Carnegie Hall for a concert la early last week. And I-, I Lucky I, uh, her. Lucky her. But this week, Carnegie Hall is closed. Um, in the New York, um, all of the art institutions, um, whether it's Carnegie Hall or the museums, and I think they're even closing, I just read they're even closing the theater, which we, we the movie theaters, I think, is still open here in Hong Kong. So I think the more we are deprived of it, absence make the hearts grow fonder. I think it'll just enhance the live experience more. But I think you can have both. You're just now figuring out how to have the digital experience, uh, online experience, as well as um, also uh, the live experience. So I, I think, uh, and even our Basel this week is doing um, virtual, virtual gallery tour, which is great. Um, I don't think that the virtual um, digital experience can really replace the actual live viewing and experience. Um, but I do think that new technology may come out. And I do think there's a big integration of digital and virtual technology, even in um, museums and institutions now, right? So I think there's going to be a convergence of the two. And I think that convergence is going to enhance our experience. But I don't think that it will replace it completely. Um, uh, last week I was in New York and luckily the MoMA was still open. <laughs> and I stood for a very long time in front of Van Gogh's Starry Night and I saw it like I never saw it before. And it, it made me think that perhaps, you know, I'm seeing it like I never saw it before, although it's on postcards, we see that image all the time, is, you know, I'm at a certain age where, you know, you, you've seen so much art and then you can come back. So re-seeing art is very interesting. Um, and, uh, you know, now we all have a little bit more time on our hands, which is quite nice. And there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of museums. I saw that the Tate and other museums are pushing you to, to take time to look at art, to spend 10 minutes in front of a painting, to really think about it. And you know this 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 amount of time that we have on our hands because of the situation is actually slowing me down, and um, and I'm thinking about all these different ways how we can engage people. Um, people are you know their lives there are occupied with many things, and and we don't have time to slow down. So. Um, you know, people want to learn about art. They want to be educated. They want to hear the story behind it. Um, and I think the platform will allow this kind of engagement in a, in a very meaningful way. So I think the conclusion, which I do agree with, is that nothing replaced experiencing an original work of art. Um, but also what remains is that sustainability is an issue with the art world and um, there are many new digital strategies that we can approach in the art world. Now, if you're interested in learning more about these, these are going to be the, some of the topics that we will explore in our online talks program at Art Power over the next few weeks. Now, before I move on to my last question, I just want to see if there's a question in the room. Yes? Oh, we have a question online. We're waiting for the mic. Uh, the question is, the, the question is, will there be any art projects to promote art education in Hong Kong's schools? Will there be any art projects to promote education in Hong Kong schools? I mean, in place already, we have a lot. I know the Friends of Hong Kong Museum of Art every year does a summer art cadets program that uh, brings in local Hong Kong students um, uh, to the Hong Kong Museum of Art. I know M Plus and the Museum of, of Art also both have had buses. That's part of their outreach programs. These are buses with uh, works of art and art educator in them that go and visit the different schools uh, in order to further arts education. Uh, for people who want to look for art on a different level, Christie's Education offers courses, um, in-person courses and also online. It's a great time now to go and check out some of Christie's Education online courses if you have extra time at home. Well, for us, um, every time we have an exhibition, we uh, go and bring the students in. If they just have to apply to our our gallery team and our art education team, and we actually um, welcome the students. They come for free, and we uh, in 
with, for educational um, uh, for schools, we bust them. We we really want to bring them in, and that was thanks to our very first exhibition um, uh, when we opened 2012, and it was a grant given to us by the Robert Ho Foundation then. And now we've learned from that experience is like sometimes you have to go and bring them in, and and dose and guided tour. Another area that we're also exploring is um, how to get the kids. Um, create their own tours um, for the exhibition coming up, uh, the outdoor one that we'll be working with the Gallery Association um, in, in April. We're hoping that we're going to get the kids in and they help curate these um, tours uh, for the kids their age and then put them online uh, if they, they cannot come. But really getting the kids, the students, um, actively involved. Um, that we're doing on our, well, on, you know, working uh, with our own team and collaborators. Um, we're not working with the Department of Education, doesn't mean we can, but I think right now, each institution, uh, I think Elaine mentioned M plus, Daigun, we all are have a very active um, community education outreach team because uh, if we don't start growing um, these audience while they're young, they're not gonna be coming back. So it's really uh, incumbent on us to really work actively and uh, to promote um, uh, these type of uh, programming. Um, and, and I wish the kids could come out because I think right now parents are afraid, but they are still, they can still, in fact, we've encouraged kids to come out uh, when we're closed. And, and you know, when it's safe, the, the, the site is so open, um, you know, they're creating um, activities for us online for their um, fellow students. Um, they know what they're missing. So I think actively engaging students and children is really important. Great, anything to add? Um, I, I just wanted to say is that we're coming to the end of the school year um, and the, the uh, art schools, the university art programs are, are going to be having their graduation shows and they are being invited to be part of this campaign as well. So that will be, you know, for the young future artists of Hong Kong, all of that is going to be happening in May and June. It's fantastic. Kiri, I think there's another question online. Yes, there's a question here from Facebook. Is online viewing rooms a temporary solution or a future trend? Um, it can definitely engage a, a wide audience um, globally, right? People who are, don't have the ability to travel. Um, we are all uh, trying to engage on those online platforms, but really a lot happens from personal relationship. The way I look at it is um, online experiences, they enhance in-person experiences as we've all discussed, nothing replaces the experience of looking at original work of art, but people find different ways to engage, and also uh, different demographics engage with art differently. We are seeing uh, the younger generation uh, being more open to the online way of engaging with the arts. Yes, question in the room. Um, this is just like a question regarding to trends. So um, will this digital platform transition of the world um, kind of would accept and push forward um, virtual art and kind of shape a new generation of art? Um, not Also right now you can buy virtual calls. I, I don't know if everybody knows. Um, you can actually buy calls from Apple and kind of look at it from your phone and um, kind of um, if galleries or in institution will kind of push forward this movement and or if you know like um, the art world will be more acceptable of online commercial artists? Well, I think you know it, art is very innovative so the sky's the limit so we can't um, always anticipate but it is always surprising and fresh what keeps coming out whether it's in art and music and fashion so I think this uh, the digital platform is a, is an artistic medium that can be furthered. Yes, I agree. Art has always been about pushing boundaries, so watch the space and let's see what happens. Oh, one more question in the back. Thank you, yes. Um, I think Our Power um, is a fantastic initiative because it's, it's such a, um, you know, a strong, cohesive group um, with a, 
a strong, cohesive voice. Um, and I think that um, there are fantastic opportunities for this group um, to take the message to other arena. Um, one, which might touch on the idea of, of bringing public art um, to where the people are, rather than necessarily to a sculpture park um, at the waterfront or a single um, shopping mall somewhere, um, but to where people are, are living and working or transiting between um, um, home and work. Um, and that's looking at, at the MTR stations and the, the, the posters and the billboards within, within MTR stations and whether or not this group, Art Power Hong Kong, might have the clout to be able to go to the MTR and to say, at this time, what about using some of your spaces to bring art to where the people are? But did you know that there are art at the MTR stations? Yeah, yeah. I yeah. mean, there's, there's lots of individual pieces there yes. that are permanently installed, but this is an opportunity to have temporary works in a much more, um, many more places. Yeah, actually, it's funny that you asked that, Jonathan. Um, we were actually, we were really inspired by this campaign in London called Art Everywhere. Um, actually just made use of billboards um, all around the city that was empty and was available. And um, the Tate had curated um, different artworks that was, I think there was 55,000 of them actually around the London city and it was a non-profit program. So we were actually thinking, we were quite inspired by it and thinking that maybe this is something we can think about doing in Hong Kong with all those MTR poster um, opportunities, you know, and billboard opportunities during this time period, you know, um, especially when business is a bit slow in advertising and marketing. So, so definitely something that we're thinking about. <laughs> well, um, yesterday, Asia Society, we took a member's tour um, to Im Tim Tsai, a little island near Sharp Island. Uh, we, we got to Sai Kung, 15 minute uh, ferry ride to this abandoned Hakka village and the art there was spectacular. Um, not quite Narashima, uh, but it was, um, I saw artwork from Hong Kong artists and it all had a Hakka origin or Hakka story. I don't, how many of you, have you been? I, I, I uh, was telling my colleague this morning, um, there were 25 of us, uh, it, it was our members tour, and we had such a great time because the, the artwork, um, the artists, I don't know how they selected it. In fact, one of the program that I would like to do is invite the artists that participated this Im Tin Zai, uh, program. It started off with an art festival, apparently in November 2019. Um, and I think it was a group of volunteers, but the artwork is really, Really interesting, and and so you got to know the the history of the village, but also history of Hong Kong, and the art was very thoughtfully, and it was just it was so accessible, and it literally in an abandoned village. So I think that kind of art is what gets me excited, uh, and I agree about public art. Um, when I'm you know in New York is um, uh, the um, High Line, but High Line also have a re regular art project. Um, and, and they make art very accessible to the people uh, and, and also the subways as well. So I really do hope this is an area where um, we can explore because I do agree that it shouldn't be just at here. Uh, our center is open, in fact, during this, this, um, uh, the COVID-19 because of the outdoor space. So we encourage people to come, but I really do th think um, whether it's MTR um, or the government to really make art accessible, promenades, and not just for a period, even though it's nice. I, I love the, the sculpture um, uh, park for, for that period, but I would love to see permanent art. Um, and I think artists are interested. So I think it's really, I, I think crisis create opportunities or think times like this. And I think we are looking at it differently and I'm hoping we will have a lot of allies in this project going forward. That's really fascinating, this Ying Ting Tsai Island village. Yim Tin Tsai. Yim Tin Tsai. Yeah, I, uh, it's a salt plain, it's salt island. The salt island is something that I have never heard of and I'd say I'm pretty immersed in the Hong Kong art world. And it's exciting to know that Hong Kong has so much to offer and I'm really pleased that we now have a platform to uh, amplify everything that is happening now in Hong Kong. So I'd like to take this as an opportunity to invite everyone to engage with our 
our platform, Our Power HK. Um, I invite you, if you wish to become a partner and you're not yet so, please get in touch. Um, if you're an individual, I invite you to share our content, to come and look at our platform, to write and to hashtag about, uh, about us. Um, hashtag is here, our power HK, hashtag HKR2020. I also invite you to contribute to the crowdfunding efforts. Um, what does the money go to? It goes to creating the website, it goes to live streaming these talks, it goes to creating the content. Some of the smaller nonprofits in the galleries, they don't really have the budget to do a very attractive um, video, that sort of thing. So that's where all the money is going to. And it goes to support Hong Kong businesses. We do plan to support local Hong Kong businesses uh, during this time. So that's about it for today. Thank you very much to my fellow panelists, and thank you everyone for listening.